and then, you know, there's Jody Lynn O'Keefe, who is incapable of not being hot in anything she appears in. I was a little interested to find that there's apparently an anti-nightmare drug um, there at the beginning. And it's nice that he's, again, stalking, you know, just like in the first. I also think the, the thing about the cops being in the wrong house there at the beginning, that's interesting, that's good, and that was pretty well done, you know, with her standing there, no, no, and just, and it drags it out a bit and makes it all the more um, interesting, you know. It's too bad that we don't care about the character because we barely know her at all. She was in the first, the second, and now this. But that's... You, she didn't have a lot of character in any of them. In the first one, it was basically because she was in it for, you know, three minutes or something. Then there's that scene where they're, like, throwing... She's throwing knife after knife at Michael. How many perfect... You know, how many large, perfect for slasher killer knives that they have in that fucking kitchen anyway. She throws like half a dozen, all of them, these, I mean, there's not a single, like, the, you know, saw kind of for bread or anything else. They're just all perfect slasher knives. Also, why do they keep reusing Sandman? It was not in the first one. It uh, It's used like twice in the second one, at the very beginning and at the very end. I, I guess it's supposed to be sort of creepy and, you know, because it's so ironic, but I didn't personally think it worked. Unfortunately, the, the script is more Kevin Williamson than John Carpenter, and if you can't tell, you seriously need to rewatch or watch some John Carpenter. And then again, we've got obnoxious characters. Seriously, LL Cool J could be written out, and it would make no impact. I mean... You could have another character be the one opening the, the gate. You know, he's annoying. The, the fucking novel that he's writing... Screenplay, sorry, screenplay. And the, um... And the irritating as fuck girlfriend on the other end is like, Oh, better say it! Gah. She was a disembodied voice, and I still hated her. And the ending has, like the world's most inept cops ever. I mean, that's that's a Hollywood cliche that the cops aren't that good at their jobs when they don't, when the movie needs them not to be, but seriously, she just walked up, I'm gonna take your gun, and I've got this. Seriously, what the fuck? And then, of course, they show up the moment he's been decapitated. Not a second before. It's not, you know, just... I did somewhat like that. I will admit the ending with her finally, literally and figuratively, facing her demon and killing him, slaying the demon, that was actually, you know, pretty, um, that was interesting, that, that was p potentially good. And it should have ended the series, even though I personally think that it should have ended with the first one that should have been the only movie to ever be made. Unfortunately, H2O didn't end it, because we got this abomination. Jamie Lee Curtis is in this for like five minutes, but that didn't stop them from putting her on the cover. She appeared in it purely because she wanted to make sure that she couldn't come back, so she appeared in it and got killed. And that was... Why did she have the the knife there when she walked over to him? How the fuck did he get a hold of the knife as they were going over the... It's just... She had the knife in her hand. How did he wind up with the knife in his hand and stabbing her? But yes, yeah, so that's an extremely disappointing end to the, the character of Laurie Strode. And why the fuck does he keep killing? There are no more female relatives left for him to kill. But yeah, Laurie Strode's doing the, the Sarah Connor Terminator 2 thing, which is kind of cool, and she does it pretty well. But yeah, so they retcon the, um, the ending of H2O away completely robbing the character of Laurie Strode of any satisfying 
you know, conclusion. And the movie again has in this one they appear to be competing over who can be the most obnoxious. And the acting is atrocious. Probably because it stars that kid from American Pie who did not distinguish himself, the black guy from um, uh, Cruel Intentions who was pretty good, one of those supermodels who think that they can act, and a rapper who most definitely cannot act. Seriously, Buster Rhymes is just horrible in this. And the fact that he actually beats Michael and that Michael walks off when told to? What the fuck was that? Made no sense. One more thing on Strode. I guess she was in that mental institution because she wanted to, like she was pretending to be catatonic, like he, you know, because does it really make sense to imprison her because she killed someone that where she thought it was self-defense, but it was really the wrong guy? Also, why the fuck didn't the guy just tear off the fucking mask or do something with his hands like it's not me or you know something but he was just like reaching for her just something seriously time after time in this movie Myers is exposed to the camera and the only reason nobody notices is that the plot needs them to not notice. It just It's ridiculous. He apparently knows the exact time when people are looking away doing something and he walks right in front of the camera or uses the you know the thing from the the camera which is apparently surprisingly sharp to stab him in the throat and just is ridiculous. Now onto the um Now, there is no fucking way in hell that a show's contestant and a show's host would have that close. I mean, when Buster Rhymes opens the door and sees that it's his favorite contestant, he's not like, how the fuck did you get the address to my house? What are you doing here? He's just like, oh, what's wrong? Like, they've known each other for years. What the fuck? That's bullshit and they arrive in the same car and they all just bullshit absolute complete fucking bullshit there's just the movie has like little connection to reality any kind of reality that the rest of us are living in does the show even make sense are they only gonna shoot it on Halloween night every year are they only gonna shoot it the one time they only got the one Myers house are they gonna do repeats? Why the fuck does Buster Rhymes think he's gonna get so fucking rich from a show that's possibly only gonna run once? Are they gonna pick another serial killer um, for you know some other time? Is that then also gonna be on Halloween night? It just it makes no sense. And we get some cheap scares again, like the armchair of doom appearing out of the. Also, when it's so clearly fucking staged, I mean. When the characters in the movie are bored, the audience is going to be bored. The moment that the characters start realizing this is staged, this is set up, this is not real, the audience is just thinking, oh, that's that's all. Why would Buster Rhymes think, think that that's Charlie in the... Why do they not seem to care that they don't hear from Charlie, the cameraman? Is he not supposed to report back? Was he supposed to be standing in the house holding a camera? What the fuck? And we get some more... Ooh, scary subliminal cuts with the mask shit. Just also, they do not look like the the two guys from Pulp Fiction at all. Also, while Sean Patrick Thomas was very good in uh, *Cruel Intentions*, he's intolerable in this one. Seriously, dude, shut the fuck up about food being the cause of everything. Okay. It wasn't funny the first time, and the fifth time... Ugh, no, shut up. We don't care. We get it. You're quirky. You're weird. Shut the fuck up. And then there at the end where Buster Rhymes says, Oh, may he never rest in peace. Dude, didn't you just say you hope he comes back as a ghost to haunt you? Isn't that what rest in peace means? 